Welcome to PL Together Lounge Talks. I'm Adam Geller, founder and CEO of Edthena, the video-powered professional learning platform. Today, we're talking with Heather Hill. She is a math expert, math instruction expert, and researches math instruction at Harvard University. She is also, along with uh, Susanna Loeb, the author of the column, What Works, What Doesn't, that appears regularly in Education Week. Heather, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Adam. So we have been talking a little bit about MQI and, you know, I think for those that are just being introduced to the persona of Heather Hill as the researcher kind of leading some of that work, uh, you know, you have a lot of kind of base knowledge about, you know, when people trying to find what does good math teaching look like. Uh, and of course now the context for teaching has changed. And so I think it really brings up this question of like, do we know what good math teaching is going to look like during an era where some teaching is online, some teaching is hybrid, some teaching is standing on my head and holding mm -hmm. my breath? <laughs> right. Um, so I, there's different ways of thinking about this. So my first, the first thing that comes to mind is any teaching is better than no teaching in this situation. So I'm just grateful that so many districts and schools have figured out how to provide students mathematics instruction online, you know, in person, outside, whatever it is that has to happen, it's been happening. And so anything is better than nothing. And I would not fault teachers for doing their best under this particular circumstance. There's a couple different ways to think about like if you wanted to move from like a sort of basic providing basic levels of instruction for kids up to something else. Um, and I, I honestly don't know what I would recommend in this situation, so I'll just lay them out and people can really think about it on their own. So the first thing that I've seen that is persuasive to me is that the best way to teach online, and there's some evidence for this, um, we had a guest columnist in the What Works, What Doesn't Ed Week column who wrote about this. Her name is Elise Gallagher, um, so you can search that up on Ed Week. But the, the best evidence from flipped classroom models seems to be that you provide a video of instruction, whether that be Khan Academy, whether that be something that the teacher records or something that the teacher has found, hopefully through a reputable curriculum provider or someone who's supplying high quality uh, video for kids. And then you uh, also ask at the conclusion of watching the video, you ask for the kids to watch, uh, to take uh, an assessment on the material that they've just learned about. And what the teacher would then do is review that material. And the next time the teacher has an in-person uh, experience with the kids or an online synchronous experience with the kids, they would then use the assessment data to figure out what needs to be highlighted in class, like what are kids not getting, and also then what would be a good extension activity. So, you know, for the time that you have working synchronously with kids in whatever format, you're kicking it up a notch. Um, beyond the material that's online. So that's one model. And I think it's not a, you know, I think people should think about whether that's the right model. I don't, I'm not 100% sure. The other model is to try to translate best mathematics teaching practices online so that you are doing the same kinds of challenging tasks. You're trying to engage kids in the same kinds of cooperative uh, thinking and really doing mathematical reasoning in engaging in mathematical practices while you are uh, remote or you're in a sort of situation where you're some days you're seeing kids in person and some days you're not. Um, my husband happens to be a math teacher and I have three kids who've been home uh, so throughout the pandemic so I get to hear a decent amount of both math teaching um, and also math learning going on in our house and I can tell you that I have heard things that make me think it is possible um, to do some of the more inquiry-based math instruction while you're online. So, you know, I hear things like the teacher gives kids a chance to work on a co like a cognitively challenging problem, gives them some time alone, sends them to breakout rooms, and then has kids come back and start to talk about the different ways groups solve their, the particular problem and lead to discussion in that way, or, you know, or just leads a discussion generally in a sort of math talk kind of setting where the teacher is, you know, going rapidly through some uh, mathematics with kids. 
So it's not impossible to do. There's, you know, I think um, my husband would tell you that he needed to find some technological fixes for this. One of the things that really bugs him as a math teacher teaching remotely is that he can't see students work, which to him is the basis for how he then um, builds instruction during a discussion period. Um, and he's had, he's experimented with various like apps and virtual whiteboards and, and things like that to you know, give him some of the feedback that he needs. I think every teacher will have something in their teaching routine that needs um, a little tweaking if they're going to go after the inquiry based math instruction in this sort of synchronous online setting. That is really helpful for bringing to life the you know, some of the ways that you might adapt in a synchronous setting. You know, I'm curious, you know, uh, and it's, it's okay if you don't have any uh, incoming thinking about this, but maybe walk us through, um, you know, for someone who's doing asynchronous teaching, maybe it's not in the flipped classroom style because maybe you're working with, uh, you know, elementary level learners mm -hmm. who aren't going to watch a bunch of videos. They're going to watch a few maybe, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, what, Walk us through some of the work that that elementary teacher might be able to do, um, you know, maybe grounded in what we know, how you would want to create uh, the right conditions or, or learning experience environments. Um, how would they kind of start to crosswalk what we already know from the in-classroom setting and maybe connect some dots into that kind of, well, uh, you know, I'm trying to construct this asynchronous offline task for my, you know, fourth grader. To be able yeah. to do. So that's a great question. Um, I think that the research that I've seen has suggested that to a couple different things. First, that teachers rely on setting up pretty strict parameters, and this is not about the math teaching itself, setting up pretty strict parameters for how kids are going to interact while online. So keep the camera on, that kids need to be attentive, um, kids need to not be like texting in the background, which I've certainly seen. Um, and that that keeps kids engaged enough that then they're able to dig into the math. So it's this combination of sort of structures, uh, a little bit of accountability, not in the sort of sense that people think about accountability, but kid accountability for turning in the work or doing the work with others, um, which is something that we know from, for instance, cooperative grouping uh, research. When kids feel a responsibility to their group, to contribute and get the right answer, they're gonna be much more likely to sort of um, engage in the work. So, you know, translating some of those findings into the online setting is also going to be, is also going to be really important. The teacher has to surveil this. I mean, you know, like, like gotta go around to the breakout rooms and find out what's going on. Uh, it's not easy to be a teacher in this setting, just it requires a lot more, you know, kind of, it requires more strategies and more effort to get the same amount of information that you would get in the classroom simply by walking around or sort of by giving a kid a look or or whatnot so yeah in some ways i hear you reminding us that teachers need to uh more than ever not forget the not to oversimplify here the basics of teaching uh which means you can't rely on persona for classroom management you need routines and structures and expectations and guidelines mm -hmm. uh, and that that uh, foundation is, you know, more important potentially in this world where students are uh, offered much more independence than they may otherwise find in an in-classroom setting. Right. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, I'm just uh, thinking again before we talked about uh, the issue of uh, precision uh, in in teaching and making sure that. Uh, you know, you don't confirm wrong answers, but also that the examples that you choose as a teacher, um, you know, are strong and clear. But I'm curious, you know, what what might be need to be on the lookout for when it comes to facilitating student talk and student discussions in a variety of environments that are looking different right now? Yeah, that's a. I mean, that's also an issue, an area that. Um, you know, teachers, it, it's again a situation where teachers have to be a little bit more effortful in making sure that they get the result um, as compared to what they would have to do in a regular classroom. So for instance, I did a tiny bit of teaching in the spring, not of math, but an online kind of small group instruction. And it was took a lot to kind of make sure that all kids were equally participating. So um, it required extra management 
on my part beyond what I thought would happen or I imagine would happen in a Zoom setting with a set of kids. Um, so, you know, there's just stuff I think that teachers need to sort of be constantly thinking about and reworking in their practice and also just be reflective about, okay, this didn't work or I'm developing this problem. Hopefully they have a coach or peers that they can go talk to and they're able to, um, you know, get some help with that kind of stuff. Because I think at this point, a lot of good information travels between teachers um, in terms of how to, how to best engage kids and, and keep kids going. I'm thinking back to the kind of framing you had before about the good, better, best uh, mindset for understanding teaching. And I'm almost wondering if we could apply that here in a little bit of a different way, which is, you know, if you've defined what good, better, and best student talk will look like, um, it, and in some ways, uh, it may be more important to do that in advance because it's less mm-hmm. about trying the uh, you know, strategy A versus strategy B to facilitate the student talk and more knowing very concretely, like, like, have I arrived at where I need to arrive? Because if not, I'm going to have to retrench and come up with another way to facilitate student talk. Because right now, everybody is scratching their heads trying to come up with the new ways for this and the new ways for that and the new ways for that. And so I know uh, it's crazy how much reinventing the wheel is going on at this point. So yeah. Uh, one of the things I, I, I liked that uh, someone else said to me in these interviews was the fact that, um, you know, everybody's back on an equal playing field again. So mm-hmm. the idea of the more senior teacher and the less senior teacher in terms of experience, like, it's really just about that kind of constant collaboration and professional learning at this point, because, you know, you all made it up two weeks ago. So you all need to be figuring no. out if it's working right now. No. I saw one teacher friends, one of them said something like, and we're all first year teachers again. <laughs> like, just really true. Like, you know, it's completely learning every aspect of teaching. And, you know, there's some stuff that transfers over, but um, learning every aspect of teaching again. Well, Heather, thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break. If you're listening to this conversation out there or maybe in your podcast stream or Maybe somebody emailed it to you and you want to hear more, head to pltogether.org. We'll be back to continue our conversation with Heather. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Adam. 